So it's my great pleasure to introduce our translational research here in this symposium. This study stemmed from our basic neuroscience uh, project uh, using animal model, but now we are trying to basic science discovery to clinical psychiatry. So my goal in this presentation is to show you how biological research can contribute to clinical psychiatry. Firstly, I will introduce this one, our target molecule. Uh, especially, I will talk about this one biological function in brain development. And then I will present this one biological data obtained from patients with schizophrenia using human neurons and clinical information. And finally, I'd like to demonstrate a possibility that uh, this disc one phosphorylation can be a biological predictor for major mental disorders. Disc one is a very interesting molecule. Its genetic mutation was originally identified coincide with major mental disorders, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, mood disorders in a Scottish pedigree. But unfortunately, further genetic data uh, about the disc one and the major mental disorders is inconsistent. Nonetheless, data from cells and animals strongly support involvement of disc one in major mental disorders. So we aim to address this stigma, uh, sorry, this enigma in this study. This slide summarizes this one biological function in brain development. These progenitor cells are proliferating cells, but pro progenitor cells stop proliferation at some time point, and they start to maturate into neurons. Neurons. Importantly, these neurons are main functioning cells in our brain. If progenitor cells stuck at proliferation stage, our brains don't work well. This is a disc one protein. Disc one protein consists of 854 amino acids, and it's expressed in progenitor cells and neurons. What we found in animal study is disc one pr protein modification called as phosphorylation regulate this conversion from progenitor to neurons. This conversion regulator, this conversion is critical for brain development and brain function. That means that this one phosphorylation at this serine 713 site is a key switch for our brain development. This finding encouraged us to study this one phosphorylation in human neurons but we cannot get human living neurons because brain biopsy is impossible. To overcome this, we have established olfactory cells. Olfactory cells from this here, so by nasal biopsy. Olfactory cells are easy to access in a clinical setting, and their molecular profile is very similar to those of developing neurons. By using these olfactory cells, we measured this one phosphorylation. This data from volunteer wizard major mental disorders. This data from volunteer suffering from schizophrenia. So you can see 
Disc 1 phosphorylation is significantly decreased in cells from patients with schizophrenia. Then we addressed this impact of this decreased disc 1 phosphorylation on neural maturation by using another kind of human neurons derived from iPS cells. So here is a result. Upper panel shows cells from volunteer without measurement disorders. And the bottom panel shows cells from patients with schizophrenia. So you can see uh, cells from volunteer without measurement disorders maturate very well. Their process gradually grow and at day 14, they made a very nice neural network. They can connect each other and transmit information by using this neural network. In contrast, cells from patient with schizophrenia maturate, doesn't maturate at all. They still proliferate. This one blue dot corresponding to one progenitor cell. The number of progenitor cells still increasing. They are still proliferate, like they stacked at proliferation status. So in cells from patients with schizophrenia, neural maturation was very slow. So far, our data observed only in culture dish. That means outside the brain. That we wanted to see, confirm these cellular phenotypes in inside the brains. But of course, we cannot put back these cells into human brain. But instead of that, we transplanted these human cells into mouse developing brains. In this experiment, we used in vitro surgery technique. We labeled cells from patients with schizophrenia and cells from healthy control by different colors and injected mixture of those cells into embryonic mouse brains. Here, green cells from healthy volunteer, red cells from patient with schizophrenia, and then we checked proliferation status by marker staining. And again, we observed <coughs> cells from patient with schizophrenia stacked proliferation status, suggesting delayed neural maturation. And finally, we investigated the relationship between disc one phosphorylation and clinical symptom. Impaired working memory is thought to be one of the main clinical symptoms in patients with schizophrenia. We tested, this, we tested working memory and blotted disc one, for, for disc one phosphorylation level and working memory score in a correlation graph. Here, patient with lower disc one phosphorylation level showed a poor working memory performance. Healthy control with higher disc one phosphorylation level showed a better working memory performance. In another word, we could say lower disc one phosphorylation predicted impaired working memory. So far, I presented biological data of DISC-1 studied in patients with schizophrenia. 
ロワーディスクワンフォスフォリレーション、ディレイドニューラルマチュレーション、アンドインペアルワーキングメモリー。コンクルージョン。We have obtained preliminary but promising support that a specific disc one phosphorylation can be a biological predictor for major mental disorders, which is reminiscent of phosphorylation of tau protein in Alzheimer's disease. Our excitement about this study is that、uh, this specific disc one phosphorylation has a potential to detect patients with major mental disorders much earlier, which may allow us prevention or early intervention to help patients with these disorders much more. Thank you. Everyone, to realize just how exciting and really revolutionary this study is. And I'm going to say pretty much the same thing about the, the second one. <clears throat> I think, I think、uh, BDRF made a, a wonderful choice in closing this symposium with two areas that are really novel and exciting. How far we've come. What she's done is connect cell biology, molecular biology, with actual patients. By transfecting things into cells. And it's not the same as getting a live biopsy, but you can't do that. This is really exciting. We've waited for many years to link molecular biology to actual clinical situations, and they're pulling it off. I've always been interested in DISC. You know what DISC means? Disturbed in schizophrenia. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we, we name things? And also, perhaps early onset bipolar. Schizophrenia is a developmental disorder, no question. And the question is is there going to be a way that even things that happen early might be corrected later through neuroplasticity? But I'll come to that in a minute. And I think perhaps early onset bipolar has many of the same characteristics of schizophrenia high psychosis rates and so forth. This molecular switch, this disc, it actually switches between cell proliferation and then. Cell migration, because it's not enough to just have a lot of nerve cells growing. You have to figure out where they belong in the brain, which layer they're in. That's, that's as critical as the neurons themselves. And what she's done with taking the molecular biology and then having five different direct approaches that work with material from patients. That's what's really novel about this. First, this ability to get olfactory cells. And, you know, the genes are the same there as they are in the brain. So, to get olfactory cells, which is a sensory, or, a sensory organ as well, gets it even closer to neurons. Now, one of the things interesting about the way she displayed that data, and I just mentioned this because I've been interested in this for many years, they use averages. We always use averages. But if you look at those, half of the, I think it's half of the controls are in the schizophrenic range. So, it would really be interesting to look back at who these people are, who the controls are. And figure out if there's something different about those half of them that fell right in the middle of the schizophrenic range. And that's true for a lot of biology. We tend to, we tend to focus on averages and we ignore individual differences. That's not, a, that's not a criticism, it's just maybe a suggestion for the next stage. And then this、uh, delayed neuronal maturation、uh, on cells taken from schizophrenics, it fits the same pattern. Again, it's using molecular biology, applying it in samples that. Derived from patients. And then the progenitors delaying the maturation, it, putting it in an embryonic mice, mouse cell. I mean, they've got the whole, they've sort of taken all the possibilities and nailed them down. Now, the question is is this a predictive biomarker? That's, that's of course, the, you know, that's the gold prize. And, or is the die cast? If you're schizophrenic and this stuff is happening very early, perhaps even in utero, are you set? How are we going to change that? And that's the issue. If you had, in fact, predictor biomarkers before people became sick, and you could focus intensively on that very few number of people who are going to have the illness as opposed to everybody else, you might be able to devise some very aggressive, very expensive interventions. 
that might take advantage of neuroplasticity and reverse what had happened. Now, I say might, but the point about getting people identified when you're talking about 2% of your population that would be so identified is to be able to focus resources on those few people, and then that, that's doable. And there's some, there's some cognitive therapy things which have been shown to have some effect on some of the distortions in schizophrenic thinking. And if you could focus that really intensively, perhaps in that small number of people who are shown to have, who are shown to be, they're gonna get schizophrenia when they get a little older, that, that would be possible. There's stress reduction. Perhaps if you had somebody who had that marker, one could conceive of ways to really reduce the level of psychosocial stress as they approach adolescence. And again, you couldn't do that with, you know, just the general population would be prohibitively expensive, but you might be able to do that with people, the very small percentage who are gonna develop schizophrenia or, for, or bipolar for that matter. You could also look at modulators of phosphorylation. You know, these are proteins that are phosphorylated, which designate and change their, their, their function. Um, you could look at NMDA receptor modulators. A number of them are now clinically available. And you could perhaps do something that might modulate sex hormones, you know, which is one of the big suspects why these, why these things have adolescent onset, as we, as we just heard about in that wonderful child psychiatry presentation. I, I'll tell you, you know, I take on these assignments because it's an opportunity to learn. And I've done this several times before, but I have never learned as much as I've learned in this assignment. These are really exciting areas, so I'm glad to have the opportunity.